I am Vijaya Jamalamarka, president of our Santa Barbara League, and we're happy to welcome our sister leagues from San Luis Obispo and Santa Maria Valley over here. The Santa Barbara League was formed in 1938 after the so-called Spanish flu pandemic. In our 82nd year, the COVID-19 pandemic has tested us in many ways, our, in our daily lives, our society, our world. We've been affected in ways we never imagined. Who would have thought we would be holding this community forum, which is generally held at Faulkner Gallery, as a Zoom meeting and reaching a much larger audience of over 200 people. Maybe we should make this permanent. Before we start, I would like to respectfully acknowledge that the land that we're on in Santa Barbara belongs to the Chumash people, and we respect that this is their unceded territory. I would also like to acknowledge what has been troubling me, as perhaps many of you, the murder of George Floyd, another senseless, ghastly murder of a black man by the very institution that is meant to protect our society. The League staunchly stands in solidarity with Black Lives Matter. We know climate change will have a disproportionately severe impact on our marginalized populations and people of color. Our League will continue to fight to eliminate systemic racism, social injustice, and inequality. There is no better time for this 100-year-old organization, the League of Women Voters, to do what we do best. We empower voters, we defend democracy, and we make it work. Let's stop for a moment of silence in respect for George Floyd and the thousands of innocent black people and other people of color who have lost their lives at the hands of our police. Please take a moment. Thank you. A big thank you to our partner, the Community Environmental Council for hosting this virtual forum. Thank you also to 350.org Santa Barbara and the Santa Barbara Public Library for co-sponsoring. We are honored to welcome all of our passionate panelists. A special thank you to Sandy Grasso Boyd, Chair of the Forum Planning Committee. The members of the committee who planned this forum include our local league members, Gail Fairburn, Mary Bird, Linda Phillips, and Colin Jones. And of course, the hardworking Kathy King from CEC. The League of Women Voters at the national level has been actively lobbying for climate change legislation, filing lawsuits and advocating for strong action on climate change. At the state level, the League uh, has a California Climate Action Task Force headed by Diz Swift, and it consists of over 300 League members from all over the state. The task force has been working on a number of issues like uh, building electrification, sea level rise, foods, soils, and agriculture, municipal climate action plans, transportation, and wildfires. Actions taken by the task force include legislation and policy advocacy, coordinating and sharing, regional forums and workshops, webinars, publications, and providing guidance to us, the local leagues. At the local level, the league, our Santa Barbara League's Sustainable Communities Committee meets monthly to discuss land use, energy, and other environmental issues and how we can advocate for actions that our government can take. 
along with our partner organizations like the CEC, the Sierra Club, and the Environmental Defense Center, we have advocated for stronger climate action plans, community choice energy, renewable energy, such as the Strauss Wind Energy Project, which is now under construction, commented on environmental documents for oil and gas projects. We've participated on the Santa Barbara Environmental Coalition, supported climate emergency resolutions, and participated in local climate action rallies. It is clear to us that our work to inform voters and hold our local government accountable is where the real potential for change lies. Please join us in our work as a new member or renew your membership in, in our, for our next fiscal year that starts in July. A link to our website has been posted in the chat box and you, can, you will receive other links soon, other informational links. I would now like to in, uh, introduce our moderator, Sigrid Wright, whom I've known for many years since the late 1990s when I served on the board of the CEC. Sigrid has 25 years of experience in nonprofit environmental management, currently as CEO or, or for the Community Environmental Council. For climate related issues, she is, on the, she is a steering committee member of the Central Coast Climate Collaborative and the Alliance for Regional Collaboratives for Climate Adaptation. Uh, CEC also works on um, energy related issues and she, uh, Sigrid is the co-author or the editor of more than a dozen CEC policy documents, including the Santa Barbara County Regional Energy Blueprint. For food system issues, she's on the executive team and the advisory board of the countywide Food Action Plan. Sigrid holds a BS in journalism from the University of Oregon and an MA in communications design from Yale Gordon College of Liberal Arts at the University of Baltimore. And she is an exemplary award-winning local leader. Please welcome our distinguished moderator and keynote speaker, Sigrid Wright. Sigrid. Thank you, Vijaya. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I'm really glad to see you all today. Um, I want to just start by thanking the, um, the committee again, as uh, Vijaya just did. And I'm gonna suggest a couple housekeeping items, one of which I've just broken. So, like, um, and that would be that if everyone could please mute your audio just to avoid the background noise, turn off any items that buzz or ding or ring, and I'm gonna do the same right now. That one just got by me. And then I'm going to invite you all to um, uh, use the speaker view so you can see the speakers more fully. So you should be able to find that in your upper right hand corner. You can toggle back and forth between views. And then I'd also like to suggest that you make that chat feature um, visible because we will be using the chat to, uh, section to curate questions. Um, in addition to our speakers, we have a support team behind all of this um, who will be adding information in the chat field um, throughout the event. So we're gonna be linking to <clears throat> different reports and, and articles and so forth. This is a very active webinar. We are asking folks to participate. Uh, what that is gonna mean is we will have a couple of polls. We'll have some breakout sessions toward the end, which are like little meeting spaces. And then as I mentioned, I hope to have a pretty vibrant discussion and Q&A. We are also uh, live streaming on Facebook and pulling questions from there as well. So let me just check in. How is, how is everybody doing? Good? Okay, great. If you have um, any technical issues, or um, you can offline with Iris Kelly, who's providing um, that support. Okay. So um, Vijaya kind of addressed this, and I want to talk a little bit more deeply about the purpose for today, which is really to educate, raise awareness, um, and increase action on climate change. I also want to recognize that we are holding this um, event, which we started planning months and months ago, but we're now holding this event amidst at least four intersecting crises. Some of these have been around for a long time, but their recent naming is really a significant step towards action. 
The first to be named locally is the climate emergency. Um, last December, the County of Santa Barbara declared our region in a climate emergency thanks to the leadership of the Climate Mobilization, Standing Rock Coalition, and County Supervisor Das Williams. And um, we're one of about 1,500 governments around the, the world that have taken a similar action. We're also, of course, in a global pandemic, which was officially recognized as an emergency by county public health officials last March. And we're in an economic recession, which um, we, many of us have felt, but um, and may have seemed obvious by the double digit unemployment and other plunging economic indicators, but has been officially named as such by national institutions in the last week. And then of course, we are dealing with systemic racism. Um, this has been you know, hundreds of years in the making since the beginning of colonialism in the US at least. Um, it's very heartening for me to see the racism officially recognized as a public health emergency by the Goleta City Council just this week. And I know that other local governments are holding, planning to hold um, sessions on this over the upcoming weeks. So today we'll be exploring the implications of these four intersecting entangled crises, including how the climate movement has been impacted by the, pande by the pandemic, by the economic shutdown, and by the social unrest that's calling out systemic racism. And also conversely, how climate change isn't just impacted by these issues, but in many ways is a product of them, and how the roots of the climate crisis can be found in our extractive and exploitive social and economic systems. So we're gonna go deep today. Um, it's notable to me that we are having this conversation also in the 50th anniversary of what has been known at, or called as the birth of the modern environmental movement. Um, that movement has a lot to celebrate. It also has a lot to reckon with, um, at least locally. It's not done a great job of engaging and lifting up all voices. And we will talk a little bit more about that today in, in terms of what's happening on that front and, and, and attempts to do a better job with that. <clears throat> but before we kind of start unpacking and all of that, I just want to provide a, a reflection. And, and that is that, um, you know, many of us are living with great privilege, even just the privilege of being here during the work day on high speed internet, having the time and space to, to be together. Um, and I'm inviting us all to just open our hearts and our ears um, to the pain and the outrage that are being vo voiced by both the people and the planet. And of course, we all want to and need to commit to the personal work that we need to do to address these issues. But I also want to acknowledge that living in an era of four simultaneous official emergencies can be exhausting. And I really want to encourage us to just hold ourselves with gentleness and compassion. These are, are really in tough times and it, it calls to mind to me um, a saying that uh, what, um, a change is good, you go first, right? So it really, um, it's very, we're in a really kind of transformative time. Um, we're seeing a lot of shifting in policies, behaviors and actions, um, some for the good, some for the bad, but a lot of shifting in a really short period of time. And as we're all noting, you know, transformation can be a messy process. Um, an image that's been coming to mind to me lately is that stage between the caterpillar and the, and the butterfly, that, that pupa stage, when basically the caterpillar dissolves into a liquid goo. And I don't, I don't know for sure, but that just sounds um, kind of uncomfortable. And so I'm holding you all with gentleness today and hope that you will do the same for yourselves. Okay, so I believe we are ready now to switch to um, transition to our first speakers. And I, unfortunately, I think that one of our speakers was not able to join us and Iris or Kathy, can you confirm that for me, please? That is correct. Okay, so <clears throat> we regret that um, uh, Madaya Quevedo could not be with us today. She partnered with us on our online Earth Day Festival. She's a great partner, helped shape um, that program. She's a, a graduate of San Marcos High School who will be attending Chapman College in the fall. A strong social activist who helped organize an anti-gun walkout and a city-wide climate march <clears throat> and who's run, won numerous awards for her poetry. So I think what we are going to do is send out her poem, which was written for today, in a follow-up email. 
confirmation? Yes, that's correct. Okay, great. All right, well, um, the intention here really had been to provide a multi-generational duo. I've been in the climate movement for over 20 years and really haven't seen anything as refreshing as what we have been seeing from the hope and fury that's coming out of the youth climate movement and paired with elders who are equally appalled at the legacy being left future generations. Um, so I am really pleased by that kind of gray wave of elders who are taking action and often using nonviolent resistance and deliberately uh, risking arrest. We're gonna start with Irene Cook, the coordinator of the Society of Fearless Grandmothers, which I think is the single best name for any organization anywhere. And Irene has a law degree from the University of Colorado Law School. She began her legal career in Colorado in child protective services and land use. She lived in Colorado for more than 40 years, having all kinds of adventures in the wilderness. Recently moved to Goleta to be near her grandchild and brought her climate activism with her. So welcome, Irene. Take it away. Thanks so much. Um, I'm going to try to share my screen here. Let's see if it works. K Kathy, can you confirm it's working? It's there, full screen. Looks great, Irene. Super, thank you. So the Santa Barbara Society of Fearless Grandmothers was formed last fall by 20 women with a shared concern for climate justice. That is seeing climate change as much as an ethical and political issue as a purely environmental problem. Not all of our members are grandmothers, but in indigenous cultures, um, a, an elder woman who cares about the next generations, the next seven generations, is considered to be a grandmother, whether or not she has grandchildren. The original Society of Fearless Grandmothers, oh, my mouse has a mind of its own. Um, the original Society of Fearless Grandmothers was founded in the Bay Area by indigenous women who have an impressive record of creative nonviolent actions, such as the one pictured here last September in San Francisco. They closed off the financial district for two blocks to allow activists to create murals representing a vision for a safe, sustainable world. In October, two of the founders shared their expertise in a training for our new independent Santa Barbara chapter. So using the phrases from our mission statement, the following slides will describe our group for you. We're wise, loving elders, gray-haired women in purple vests, trained to stand on the front line to keep streets safe for people engaged in acts of nonviolent civil disobedience. That was what we were trained to do. We believe that older women can contribute a certain type of authority, strength and compassion to help keep the peace. We're willing to be arrested and we understand the risk of being harmed. We can stand up to authority and speak truth to power. So far, unfortunately, the only thing that has kept us out of the streets has been the COVID-19 pandemic. The decision to stay home was based not on fear, but on our feeling of responsibility and respect for our families and our community. So this was an extremely difficult decision. We're committed to nonviolent civil disobedience action. The key word being action, which makes it so hard to stay at home. We feel that disrupting business as usual is the most effective means of creating change in society, as in the women's suffrage and civil rights movements. Being a small independent group gives us a lot of flexibility to determine our own actions and alliances. We demand urgent measures to address the climate emergency. There can be no change without demand. We have demanded that the Santa Barbara County supervisors deny any new permits for fossil fuel projects. And we'll continue to demand that all responses to the COVID-19 crisis focus on a just transition away from the fossil fuel economy to address climate justice, protecting people and not profit. We join in demands for reform to stop the long history of racial injustice. We can no longer tolerate a planet where anyone's right to breathe is compromised by police brutality or pollution. 
We strive to protect the vulnerable, that is, our grandchildren, our future generations, protesters in the street, communities impacted by injustice, and all life on Earth. We strive to inform our communities. We must raise awareness of climate issues. There's so little mention of the climate crisis in the mainstream media, it's maddening. And only about 40% of Santa Barbara residents even ever talk about climate issues occasionally, according to a recent poll. There have been countless graphs illustrating the COVID-19 situation over the past few months. This curve showing the out of control increase in atmospheric carbon needs to get a lot more attention. And we will work to end the silence and raise awareness of the need for action. Finally, the last element of our mission statement to support all who are working to promote a just and sustainable planet for all living creatures and generations yet unborn. So activism in the time of the COVID-19 crisis has been a challenge. We so appreciate the online adaptations for virtual activism organized by various national and local groups during the pandemic. We would like to get back in the streets with these allies and we'll do that as soon as possible. Before the pandemic, we were engaging in public actions such as the one pictured in earlier slides and we held weekly Fire Drill Friday rallies. But on Earth Day, instead of demonstrating on State Street, we crafted collage messages that were emailed to the county supervisors and the governor. We can't predict what 20, but we're certain that we will continue to use our creativity and our energy, however we can, to fulfill our mission. So thank you so much to the League of Women Voters for letting us share our story, and thank you for listening. Here's how you can connect with us, and this will be in your follow-up email as well. Thanks so much. Thank you, Irene. That's super inspiring. Um, I want to see if anybody has any questions or comments about the Society for Fearless Grandmothers here. You can use the um, chat feature. Okay. All right. Well, I think we are, what we're going to do next is actually um, kind of tee up for an understanding uh, uh, or get a better sense of the room as we tee up for the next couple of sessions here. So Iris is going to run a quick poll for us. If you wouldn't mind doing that, please, Iris. Do you want the, the one on protests? Yes, please. So there are three questions and that should be up on your screen right now. Um, it'll give you a little time to, uh, to answer. Okay. It wouldn't let me submit. By the way, if anyone's having a hard time submitting, um, you have to fill out the second question. So maybe if for the first question you say that you did participate, just click other. I think you have to answer every question to submit it. I did. Apologies for that. We'll fix that on the next round. <laughs> okay. Um, so Ivor had a question actually, so let's just ask that real quick before we move into the next section. And this is for you, Irene, and it's your source for the 40% of people talking about climate change. I am, I, I am posting that in the chat as we speak. If I can figure out how to do this, well, let's see. Let's see if this works. Uh, oh, no, that just went to Emily privately. Oops, sorry. So let me go to everyone and 
paste it. Very good. I, I hardly recommend the Yale Climate Communication website. There's a wealth of research on um, all kinds of, of, of uh, public opinion polling and information on climate at, that, at this website. And this, this one, you can click on uh, a particular state and narrow it down to a county um, to get current polling data. Okay, thank you, Irene. Any other questions for Irene? Okay. Well, can we just, maybe um, a few of us can just unmute for a minute and just give a big shout out to the Society for Fearless Grandmothers. You guys deserve a lot of Yay. 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 Thank you. Yay. Thank you for all your Thank you. Thank you, Irene. That was excellent. Thank you. And I, I, I will be a um, fearless grandmother as soon as I get off of this meeting and join up. Can I do that online? Um, you can go to our website, and there's a, a link to send a message. Great. Thank you. All right. Well, welcome to the new folks who've been joining us. Just very quickly, we're going to ask you now to go back to mute. That was really fun to hear everybody's voices. And um, <laughs> we're going to ask you to go back to mute, turn off your buzzing, dinging noises, and um, invite you to put on the speaker view so you can see your speakers and the slides. And um, open up the ch uh, chat feature on the side because that's where questions and, and uh, comments are going. Um, Lisa, could you please go ahead and pull the, the poll results up? We're, I'd love to hear how that went. So we've got about it's a little under a third that have participated in recent protests and a little under a third whose friends or family have participated. And then maybe a little under half who have not participated, the primary concern being COVID. Okay, that's useful information. Janet, you look like you had a question. You'll have to unmute. The two categories I have participated and my family has participated. Is that not something that should be combined? Um, it might. It might depend. You might have. I think we. You might have staff. You excuse me. You might have family members who are participating, but you're not. But but you could only pick one category in that poll, right? Yeah, I think, thank you, good, good to note. <laughs> so I, I'm not sure which way that would work. I could pick more than one. Oh, Very you could? Good. Okay. All right, folks, we're gonna, um, we've been posting the website for the Fearless Grandmothers in the, in the chat box, and unless there are any other questions for Irene, I'm gonna, we're gonna move on to the next speakers. Okay, you're good. So as it happens, I'm the next speaker. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the um, kind of climate threats on the central coast, what we're looking at, and then um, some of the solutions that CEC, the Community Environmental Council, are working on, kind of widen that lens a bit, and then we'll go on to some other um, speakers who will tee off of that and go a little bit deeper. So, um, Iris or Lisa, whoever is running my presentation, you could go ahead and pull that up. All right. Okay, so we're gonna, um, I'm gonna talk first about um, some of the recent reports that have come out on, uh, on climate from, the, you can go to the next slide please, slide two. On the um, IPCC report, the national, the, the U.S. report and California's assessment all came out within a few months of each other a little over a year and a half ago. And all of them said the same thing, that we have until 2030 to make rapid significant change to avoid the worst case scenarios of climate change. That should absolutely not be taken that we have 10 years to act. Um, we do not. Uh, when I say we have 10 years to rapidly transition, that's what I mean. Um, uh, there's there's no like, um, moment at which a th switch is thrown. We are already, as you 
all know, um, feeling some amount of the, uh, the impacts and we are already locked into some amount of chaos. Um, what we've been seeing in recent years is the result of less than one degree of warming. But I wanna dig into the, um, next slide, the, the state report, which for the first time did a, an assessment also by subregions within the state. So there is a, um, a report just on the central coast. And we're gonna place the um, link to that central coast climate assessment in the comments. <clears throat> and the, um, in that report, the state identified six threats for our region and none of them will be a surprise to you. All of them have public safety or public health concerns, equity concerns, economic impacts. And remember that all these threats are neither separate or equal. They will compound and cascade and affect different populations differently. The first one that I wanna talk about actually is ex extreme heat. And it's the one that I think it's the, less, the least amount of air time and one that has my attention and is probably the most concerning to me. Um, these are the temperatures over the last decade globally. You'll see, sorry, um, let's go to slide four, please. <clears throat> these are the um, temperatures of, over the last decade. You'll see that 19 of the 20th hottest years on record have been in the last 20 years and that, um, or since 2001, and that the hottest have all been in the last five years. Ex and next slide, the extreme heat, what that means in our region is de it's defined as um, five days in a row over 85 degrees. And anyone who has spent time in inland areas, that might not sound that hot, but we do not have the infrastructure in, on the central coast to handle that much heat. We don't have um, air conditioning. We weren't, we weren't built or designed for this. It's also important to remember that our region is warming faster than anywhere in the lower 48 states. You may recall a Washington Post article about this last year, which recently won a Pulitzer Prize. And in fact, maybe someone on my team could post that as well. And that, um, that article reported that in the last 125 years, Santa Barbara County has warmed by 2.3 degrees average and Ventura County by 2.6 degrees and Ventura County now being the fastest warming county in the lower 48 states. So with extreme heat become, become really significant inequities, um, particularly on the populations that are affected by it. Um, there are, there's a lot of data around the impact of extreme heat having disproportionate effects on the very young, the very old or frail populations, on people of color, on homeless, low in communities, low income communities, people with underlying health conditions such as heart disease or high blood pressure. To me, that sounds really similar to what we just went through with COVID, right? It's um, having a disproportionate effect on, the, on many of the same populations. And so in some ways, we've kind of been through a trial run. I'm gonna move to the next slide. Um, the other, I'm gonna click more quickly through these next climate threats. I had just really wanted to draw your attention to heat. And you're more familiar with these, so longer droughts, I just particularly want to point out that um, agriculture is our county's number one economic driver and that drought has a huge impact on that sector. Okay, yes, yeah, so there's a question about how is Central Coast being defined here for this presentation. Um, the, the report I am referring to from, the, um, from California, it is from Monterey, excuse me, from Santa Cruz all the way down through Ventura. So it's six counties, including San Benito, Monterey, Santa Cruz, San Benito, uh, San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara, and Ventura. Um, some of the data I gave you, particularly about those, uh, the hottest um, warming trends were for Santa Barbara and Ventura County. Okay, we also, um, Another threat identified by the state is increased fire danger. We don't need to even discuss this. We've all been through a master class on this in the last few years. Um, we know the many ways this affects us, public health, um, public safety, and also economic um, tourism being another one of our top industries. But I do wanna pull to the surface here that um, public safety power shutoffs. If you remember this last, this was so last year, <laughs> this, we were talking about PSPS instead of PPE. Um, we, these are not going away. So uh, that concern is um, still very real. real um, public safety power shutoffs can be triggered 
or activated during high fire danger, high heat, high wind, low humidity. I would absolutely expect to see some this summer. Um, we already uh, experienced a number of those throughout the region, throughout Edison Territory, and we're in Edison Territory in the southern part of our county. You can look for workshops from the Community Environmental Council this year or this summer about home batteries, including incentives for high-risk communities and low-end communities. Um, another risk or threat identified by the state is sea level rise. And I always find it interesting how this threat gets framed as being far off and in the future and not something that needs to be worried about but can be dealt with later. <clears throat> I have, if you go to the next slide, I have two concerns about sea level rise. Um, the first is how much infrastructure we're dealing with. In southern part of our county, pretty much all of our critical infrastructure, pretty much all of our transportation in infrastructure, Highway 101, the railroad tracks, the airport and surface streets are all at risk, as well as um, much of our other critical infrastructure, such as the desal plant, the wastewater treatment plant. And we're also talking about a lot of housing and not just high-end homes. Um, CEC recently did a project with SB CAG in which we identified high-risk areas in um, Carpinteria and in Isla Vista, where Isla Vista could literally be, become an island, be islanded by, um, by storm flooding. My second concern about sea level rise and storm surge is that we're already experiencing no, no. flooding and beach loss. And when these two things are compounded with each other, um, they it can have quite an impact. And so preparing for all of this is gonna require a lot of planning. It's some armoring, some retreat, and years and years of work. And we tend to be, um, you know, as humans and as, our, as a community, we tend to be more reactive to crises, but this one will really bite us if we don't properly plan. Um, before I get off the climate threats identified by the state, I just want to point out um, the, uh, one that's not identified by them, but clearly something that we want to pay note, um, take note of, and that's the risk to ocean health. Um, you know, our, the ocean for Santa Barbara, it's really part of our DNA and our identity. Um, the ocean is, our, there are, the beaches are our cooling centers. This is where we go for mental health refuge. And it's why many of us are living along the central coast. Um, again, we did kind of a trial run with COVID-19 of what it feels like to have our beach access restricted on hot days. There were some very hot days in April and May in which the state beaches were closed. And we even saw some public beaches in, in Southern Ventura County that were closed to non-locals, which meant they were accessible only to wealthy beachfront owners. So this is the kind of stuff that we wanna watch for. So all of this is rolling up into one story, which is to my point earlier, it doesn't just feel like we're having more crises and disasters. There are more crises and disasters. You can see um, over the last 30 years, what um, the, the compounding effects of those. My concern is what happens when these events do start to compound. For example, if we see a heat wave and a power shutoff or poor air quality with wildfire smoke while we're navigating the pandemic. So I'm gonna turn a corner now. That was a lot of uh, heavy stuff. I'm gonna turn a corner and we're gonna talk about what we can do. So I'm gonna just invite you to take a breath and kind of shake it out. Giving you a definition here of climate resilience. And what I like about this definition is its pairing of environmental and social systems. And we've been really drumming on that today about um, how our community is only resilient and healthy when everyone is heard and cared for. So let's get to some of the specific solutions and cause for hope. Um, <clears throat> the first thing we need to do, of course, is stop drilling and keep it in the ground. And I know that um, our, our next speakers are gonna talk more about that, so I'll leave that to them. But um, I'm gonna focus more on the rapid transition to renewables. And one of the um, primary um, strategies that the Community Environmental Council identified over a decade ago to the closest thing that we have to a silver bullet is what's called community choice energy. And you all know it because we've been doing um, workshops with the league, but we have something to celebrate here that um, over the last couple of years, we all have successfully advocated for 19 cities and two counties having joined community choice energy programs. Some of those programs have started down in the Ventura area, 
and some are um, um, getting ready to start. May, uh, slowed a little bit by um, the pandemic, but still in process. So for those of you who don't know, community choice energy programs allow local governments to determine where and how they get their electricity, including the option to um, rely on 100% renewable energy rather than the mix that's coming from utilities. Okay, uh, another piece of really good news is that uh, we have a big wind here in Santa Barbara County. We're getting our first wind farm in, um, in the Lompoc area. For those of you who are familiar with uh, the drawdown plan, I just set it aside, but the drawdown plan, which was published in 2017 by Paul Hawken and did an in-depth calculation of the top 80 strategies for reducing global emissions. Several of those strategies are ones that CEC works on and that they, and they are in the top 10. So um, onshore uh, wind turbines are, is in, are number two, the, number, the second most um, important strategy according to drawdown. The, um, that wind farm, by the way, you can see in the, in the note there is enough to, well, we broke ground, we, they broke ground on it in May and after decades of planning and advocacy and will be enough to power for 43,000 homes. Next slide. So the, the other thing that continues to um, just be one of the most cost effective and um, uh, fast growing opportunities in our region is solar. And that is another one of the top, I think it's number 10 in the drawdown book. Um, our solarized program has added more than 800 solar rooftop systems, but when really what you wanna look at is the aggregate for our region and the fact that renewables are now producing more electricity than coal um, during, at least during the first quarter of 2020. Solar is growing um, very rapidly. Okay, next slide, please. So I think we're starting to get the vision here where we will clean up the grid and get people out of gasoline vehicles. Um, so we continue to really drum on the electric vehicle push here. There are now a thousand electric vehicle charging stations in our region. Um, um, after rebates and incentives, most electric vehicles can be purchased for the same price now as similarly sized cars that are fueled by gasoline. It's also possible to lease plug-in electric vehicles for fairly inexpensively, as much as a zero down and $200 a month for a lease. We're particularly excited because there are some incentives that are, um, make, it make low to moderate income households eligible for electric vehicles. So they can take those rebates down even further, down to zero down and maybe as low as $100 a month. Wow. And then there are some also the, some incentives for used electric vehicles. So we're gonna paste in the comment section a website, which is electricdrive805.org. That's an um, uh, initiative that CEC is working on. And we did a, a really great webinar on this last week with over, I think almost 300 people. And that, I believe that that webinar is posted on Electric Drive 805. If it's not, then we'll post it in the comment field as well. Excellent. Okay. Another um, strategy that we're um, putting a lot of time and energy into is not just reducing the amount of, of emissions, but dealing with legacy emissions in the atmosphere. atmosphere. And um, you might hear this under different names. You might hear it under carbon farming, carbon sequestration. Sometimes a regenerative agriculture kind of is an umbrella for all of that. Um, so the state of California recently concluded that within the next 25 years, we need to draw about 125 million metric tons of carbon out of the atmosphere in our state to achieve carbon neutrality, to achieve the state's carbon neutrality goals, which is a very big lift. 85% um, of those, what we call negative emissions, need to happen through the changing, of manage, the way we manage our organic waste and how we manage our natural and working lands. So CEC is doing work on both of those fronts. We're um, working with farmers and ranchers to um, help them learn from each other about how to change practices. And then we are um, also working on reducing food waste. I'll get to that in a moment. The County of Santa Barbara has um, really been listening to this. They're developing a carbon sequestration and accounting tool, which will result in a high level carbon sequestration goal for our county. That's um, real progress for, the, for a conversation that we only just started with them a couple of years ago. 
Okay, next slide. We're coming toward the end of my presentation. Um, the, another top strategy that CEC works on and that is um, noted in drawdown, it's the number strategy number three in drawdown was the reduction of food waste. California now has laws that are preventing food waste from going to landfill. Um, we're supporting the jurisdictions in, in, in assessing and implementing um, those laws. As you know, many of you know, about 40% of all food waste, um, all food produced in the U.S. goes to waste, and those numbers hold true for our state and our region. And uh, one of the areas where we're most focused is on food rescue, so rescuing um, usually prepared but definitely edible food, food that you and I would be willing to eat. And um, it's usually coming from a caterer or a restaurant on its way to the landfill. We intervene, we, we capture that, and we direct it to organizations that feed people facing hunger in Santa Barbara County. So um, that program really kicked into a high gear. It went from a pilot into a full-fledged program in the span of about two weeks um, at the beginning of the pandemic as we have helped match um, uh, chefs and restaurants with um, agencies that are pe feeding people in need. Hmm. The last thing I just want to call attention to, which is um, really important to me personally, is the work that we are doing in partnership. And we have a number of partnerships, including the Food Action Network and um, some our climate resilience work. But the climate just, Central Coast Climate Justice Network is um, near to my heart and um, one that I helped co-found and the, ne the next speakers are also participate, are um, delegates in the Climate Justice Network. This is a Santa Barbara and Ventura County Alliance of um, environmental groups and social justice groups. Many of them you, uh, often in the more traditional spaces for social justice or, in, or environmentalism, trying to um, work together, identify ways in which we can support each other, be in solidarity with one another, and help um, promote a climate justice um, agenda. Okay, so that is my turbo blast. I am gonna come back now and just check in on everybody. Okay. I think what we might do here is, um, I think I might just go ahead and introduce the next speakers, Emily uh, Williams and Ana Rosa Centeno, and then we can unpack my talk and their talk um, together in, when we get through this section. So as I was just mentioning about the Climate Justice Network, I have the pleasure um, of working with both Emily and Ana Rosa um, through the Central Coast Climate Justice Network. Both of them are overachievers, which I just love. Um, Emily is a PhD candidate and an NSF fellow in geography at the, at the UC Santa Barbara. Her research is on climate accountability and climate justice. When she was an undergraduate at UCSB, she co-founded the UC Fossil Fuel Divestment Campaign, Fossil Free. She's worked on various climate change movement spaces, including youth civil society and the United Nations climate negotiations. And she's a co-founder of several other advocacies around climate justice. And she's on the steering committee for 350 SB. So, and that was just half of her bio. Uh, Anna Rosa it, um, served as the mayor of Maywood, which is a town in Los Angeles County. She was a former executive director of Pueblo and a California lead organizer for the National Farm Worker Ministry. She serves currently as the president on the boards of the La Casa de la Raza and the Central Coast League of Conservation Voters, as well as serving on other, several other boards and committees. And by day, she's the senior organizer for Food and Water Watch here on the Central Coast. So Emily and Ana Rosa, I'm gonna hand it to you. All right, well, thank you so much, Sigrid. Um, and thanks for everyone so much for your time and attention. I know on this very hot day, right, in this warm, warm world, um, it's hard to maybe focus on our screens all the time. So we're gonna take you on a pretty rapid tour of a couple of different things. And so I'm gonna start to screen share. Um, and I wanna sort of take you to where Sigrid so beautifully left us off. Um, and then I'm going to pass it off to Ana Rosa and just FYI, so everyone knows Ana Rosa is having a little bit of connectivity issues. Hopefully she's going to be able to stay connected during this time, but worst case scenario, I'll be able to cover some of her slides. But I hope you can hear her because she's freaking awesome. 
Um, okay, so I'm gonna spend uh, my time talking about how we got here to where we are right now in 2020 to understand how we need to move forward. Um, the crux of my comments really, if you're gonna take anything away from them, is that if we're gonna fix climate change, it's gonna have to be done in an intersectional systemic way. And one of the key takeaways from that is climate justice is inseparable from racial justice. And so as Sigrid showed you, um, climate impacts are here and now. So already, for instance, April 2020, this is a map of the world, the climate change anomaly. Um, the global average temperature is already 1.16 degrees warmer than it was uh, before humans started messing with the climate. And so in this warmer world, again, we're seeing all of these impacts. And so across the United States, for instance, climate scientists have already started to identify the fingerprints of climate change in some of the no most notorious extreme events. And so from droughts to floods, heat waves, fires, et cetera, scientists have actually identified the ways that climate change have made some of these events that much more severe. And so in part of my research working with Professor Leah Stokes in political science, we went through and we uh, documented a bunch of different uh, climate change studies and tried to compile them into these fact sheets. And we're gonna send you all a link to the fact sheets so you can see them. You can see how climate change has made them worse. So the bottom line, what I want you to take away from this is all this is happening again in just this one degree Celsius warmer world. So when we talk about limiting global average temperature to, to 1.5 or two degrees, we're talking about accepting that things are gonna get worse. So all that said, having seen how bad it already is, you're probably asking yourselves where we go from here. But in my opinion, to see where we're gonna go from here, we need to first understand how we got here in the first place. And to understand both of those, we need to understand again that you cannot have climate justice without understanding the past and how it's led to the emissions today. And so I'm gonna start out with this claim, which hopefully all of you are on board with, but if not, I'll show you why. Climate change could not exist without colonialism and capitalism. Climate change as we have it today could not exist without them. Right here, you see a couple of screenshots and I'll share the link to the video so you all can watch it on YouTube. But you see a couple of screenshots, first in 1870 and next in 1951, and you can see where the emissions are coming from. And what I want you to notice is that emissions started post-industrial revolution, mostly in Western Europe, and then with the settler colonialism of other areas, for instance, in what we now call the United States, and the colonialism of the African continent, of, the, of India, you start to get this increase in extractivism. And so, not only that, so that's sort of the starting point, is then when you fast forward and start to look at uh, capitalism really ramp up post-World War II, you then have companies, right, who are extracting these uh, products like crazy coal oil and gas. So today, um, pretty much all the emissions can be traced to very specific fossil fuel companies. You'll see here just 100 companies in the world are responsible for 71% of all historical emissions. And again, we'll make these, um, these links available to everyone after the, the talk. So all that taken together, we need to understand that climate change as it exists now, again, could not exist without these things. It is very specific product of that settler um, colonialism and that capitalist system, which bases values on the accumulation of wealth and uses fossil fuels to build that wealth. So not just that, the last thing is these companies, many of the same ones, Chevron, ConocoPhillips, BP, ExxonMobil, and Shell, for years have run disinformation campaigns. They knew that their products were contributing to climate change back in the 1950s. They had their own scientists doing the research. What did they do about it? They hid it. And so now we have lost precious time because of this delay. And so now, right, in 2020, the question is what we do about it. And as Sigurd talked about, I'm gonna just go back to these reports real quickly because I think they're super important, possibly because I'm a PhD student nerd, but there was these two uh, reports that came out in 2018. And so the first one was from the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And again, that 2030 mark, I wanna be really specific. We have to cut all global greenhouse gas emissions in half over the next 10 years. This is not just for the United States. We're also talking about places, right, that are still developing, that are still trying to overcome the effects of imperialism and colonialism. In addition to that, though, there was some, uh, a couple of studies and a report by the International Energy Agency that came out that were looking at it and found that we can actually do that. We can cut those emissions in half so long as we do not build any new fossil fuel infrastructure. And that's what that second sort of study is showing you down here. 
So, so long as we don't build any new, uh, drill any new wells, build any new pipelines, et cetera, we can actually limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And so that's uh, what a lot of folks are working on here, including 350 Santa Barbara, including Food and Water Watch, including a lot of different organizations who I'm not gonna mention because there's so many and they're all really great. Um, we have been working on trying to ensure that we keep fossil fuels in the ground. And we've had some successes. Uh, just over the past couple of months, two companies have already pulled their proposals to drill new oil wells up in the northern part of the county. They would have totaled like over 400 new oil wells. And so we can do this. It's just gonna take a lot of hard work. So setting that up, right, we kind of have this idea of how we can do it, but right now we're still just talking about emissions within this context of like climate change as this siloed issue that doesn't intersect with anything else. But as you all know, things don't work that way. As Sigrid set us up, we're living in a moment of a lot of different emergencies. As so a 2020, the way that I've been thinking about this when I get over the exhaustion is we're living in a flashpoint. And I really like this tweet that I saw. So um, just to read it out real quick, this person tweeted, my nine-year-old asked, mom, what's that sound? And she said, and I added part of this quote, is that's the warning for the curfew tonight as police respond with brutality and racism to the protests against police brutality and racism during a global pandemic in a year that more likely than not will be the warmest on record. If anyone else is exhausted by that tweet, that makes sense because it can seem really overwhelming because we're dealing with a lot of different issues. This, none of this stuff is new though. 2020, I've seen a lot of uh, people talking about they just want it to be over, you know, wait for the next year to come. But this stuff has been boiling over for a really long time. Racism, climate change, people also, epidemiologists have been warning about the possibility of a pandemic for a while. But the point is, we can't just wish that 2020 would be over. All of these things are happening now, again, because they've been boiling over for a very long time. So in some ways, 2020 offers us a really unique opportunity, a really painful opportunity, but an opportunity nonetheless to deal with these th things because we're now being forced as a global society to contend with all of these issues together and see how connected it all is. And so with that, I wanna really make this point and go into details about the fact that this stuff is interconnected. It's often said, many of you might've heard this phrase that the, those who are most impacted by climate change are least responsible. This is true and it can also be said for a lot of different things, not just climate change. So um, climate change doesn't discriminate. It doesn't care if you're white like me. It doesn't care if you are Latina or Latino or black. What does care is the social, political, and economic systems that we have built as a global society that discriminate against people and put people in harm's way of climate impacts. Climate doesn't care. It's the companies who have perpetuated climate change. It's the systems that we have built that have let these things happen and then forced people into living in these very um, exposed areas. And so all these things that we're experiencing right now in 2020 are incredibly interconnected. Um, quantitatively, tangibly, and measurably. And so for instance, here's just a couple of um, headlines. I was gonna fill in a Venn diagram and there was too much text to put in there. So I just wanted to show you these things. Um, you can take, for instance, those who are most vulnerable to climate impacts all, tend to also be those who are most polluted by major greenhouse gas emitting industries and are also those who are most vulnerable to COVID. And the reason is because if you live next to a coal-fired power plant, and you're breathing in particulate matter all the time, if you contract COVID, you are much more likely to get extremely sick or die because of an already weakened immune, uh, respiratory system. Those people tend to be people of color in lower income communities. These communities are some of the same ones that are also facing deadly police violence and years of racism, right, that have existed as long as this country has been called the United States, even before then. On top of that, then when you have protests against police brutality and police respond with pepper spray, that makes people sneeze and cry and cough and spew particulate matter and irritates the respiratory system further, exacerbating the spread of COVID and also making people much more susceptible to severe impacts from it. You can also see other examples. If we look back at, for instance, Standing Rock, if you remember the Dakota Access Pipeline that was being built through North Dakota, you see, for instance, the example of police, the National Guard that was deployed there in riot gear, just as we're seeing right now with protests, 
who met peaceful land defenders, indigenous land defenders with incredible violence and injured a lot of people for defending their land and their water. So these things are connected, right? If we talk about this stuff like it's not connected, we're never gonna solve any of it and it's gonna seem too overwhelming to do it. If we're gonna address climate change again, if we're gonna cut emissions in half over the next 10 years, it is insufficient to just replace fossil fuels with renewables in the same system. When something bad is born of a system, you don't just change the bad and keep the system as it is. You need to change the system. And there's very specific ways to do this, but just real quick before we do that, and then I'll wrap up and pass it over to Ana Rosa. If you don't believe me, I think COVID is a really good example of why we can't deal with these things one off. COVID has given us perhaps the clearest, most tangible example of why only more broad changes are gonna fix climate change. So here's the logic. If we believe that we could fix climate change just by consuming less, then we would be on track to fix it right now because a lot of people are staying home, not driving and not flying. So is it working? The answer is not really. Emissions right now are down from transportation, but major industry, a lot of manufacturing and things like that, uh, trucking, those kind of things have not stopped because of COVID. So climate scientists, really well-respected ones like Catherine Hayhoe, you're seeing her tweet here, um, Kate Marvel, who's done incredible work, are warning us against looking at COVID as some sort of miracle climate solution. And in fact, again, the International Energy Agency, hardly, right, like a sort of fringe entity, um, said in their 2020 report that they fear that the rebound in emissions after COVID ends may actually be larger than the decline unless the wave of investment to restart the economy is dedicated to clear, cleaner and more resilient in energy infrastructure. So the IEA here is giving us our marching orders and I'm gonna pass it over to Ana Rosa to talk about specifically what that entails. But as a teaser, what it's gonna entail is that any path forward on climate is gonna to need to address racism, colonialism and be systemic. It involves building out regional Green New Deals and just transitions. These approaches include racial justice, economic justice, environmental and climate justice. They respect indigenous sovereignty of land and unceded territory. And we have a chance to build one here in Santa Barbara and Ventura counties, but we need your help to do so. As Ana Rosa is gonna tell you about the work that's going on locally and all that you can do to get involved. So with that, um, hopefully she's still connected. Um, I'm going to stop talking and Ana Rosa, I'm gonna pass it over to you and I'll switch to your slides as well. Yes, I'm able to stay on. I'm very excited that this worked out. Uh, I've already gotten kicked off 10 times, so <laughs> yay. Um, so just, uh, Emily already alluded to it, but we cannot have climate justice unless we fight for racial justice. It has gotten to a point where people cannot be treated after thoughts. We are all human beings. And to start, um, next slide. So I'm gonna talk about the Green New Deal house meetings that we're having, but um, in order to integrate that um, or to really move forward with that, we feel like it's absolutely key for us to integrate the Black Lives Matter um, demands into it and to not forget the black women have, who have also been killed um, due to police brutality. Uh, here, this is a picture of Breonna Taylor. It would have been her 27th birthday on Friday, but she was shot eight times in her home, eight times in her own home. We must remember to stand up for black women who often get left out of this narrative because yes, many, many black men have been killed and you know, many black women have been killed. And it is uh, very important for us to go even beyond allyship, but also talk about being accomplices. Next slide. And just to reiterate, um, this is not an issue that is just other places. This person here is Megan Hockaday. She was actually a Santa Barbara local. She went to Santa Barbara High School. She was a cheerleader. Um, and her, like many Black families, have been pushed out of this community because of housing costs and racism. Um, and she uh, was actually um, killed within 20 seconds of the police breaking into her home while her three daughters were there. 
I'm going to say that again. She was killed within 20 seconds of the police breaking into her home with her three daughters there. So this is why I say that racial justice is critical for us to fight for. Um, next slide. So this is the demands of Black Lives Matter Santa Barbara. And you may have read the article that um, the Santa Barbara City Council did approve these. However, it is going to take time for implementation. And we all need to be vigilant to make sure that they get implemented in a way that honors these demands. The first is uh, that we demand that the Santa Barbara City Council adopt a resolution condemning police brutality and declare racism a public health emergency. We demand transparency and accountability from the Santa Barbara Police Department. So no more community conversation without actual changes to policy and practices. No more internal investigations of misconduct. We want to create a civil review board with members selected by community. We want to prioritize mental health services and rehabilitation. We also demand transparency and accountability from the Santa Barbara County Sheriff. We need an update to the use of force policy to center de-escalation. No more isolation and quarantine for inmates attending court or ca contacting their lawyers. Reduce jail admissions by redirecting people to community-based mental health and substance abuse treatment services. And the contacts for the people who you can email are at the bottom of this slide. So the police chief, the sheriff, the county board of supervisors, um, our local city council. We demand protection and preservation of black landmarks rather than monuments to white supremacy. If you have walked around the Santa Barbara courthouse, there is actually a big plaque to the white women who colonized this place. And that's still here in the year 2020. Um, St. Paul AME, Friendship Baptist Church, and Franklin Neighborhood Center have been symbols for Black unity and peace. Uh, we need to prioritize the restoration of these spaces and name their Black creators. We demand institutional support for an annual Juneteenth celebration. Juneteenth is Emancipation Day. It's a city and county commitment to allocate funds for this annual celebration of Black emancipation and liberation. Uh, there's a Juneteenth organization that has been doing this in a very grassroots way, and we ask for the city to, deport, to support um, that grassroots effort. Skip that one. But skip the next one. So yeah, that's everything I read. Um, you can skip that one too. Sorry, this is a longer presentation, but I'm abbreviating it. So all of these demands, we're integrating it into um, the, these Green New Deal house meetings. Um, and the history of these house meetings, and uh, I'm sure there are other examples around the country, but in California, the strategy was first used by the National Farmworker Association, which is now the United Farm Workers. It was co-founded by Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta. Um, the UFW website describes them as the, ba the basic organizational building block of the farm worker movement. Uh, Dolores Huerta and Chavez both traveled around the central valleys of California, going from town to town to meet with farm workers in their homes and learn about their struggles. Fred Ross Sr. mentored them in house meeting strategy. Um, sometimes two or three people would come and sometimes nobody would come at all. So it is a strategy that requires perseverance. Next one. So why house meetings? The reason is because it's a perfect example of grassroots organizing. Um, it brings together collective intelligence to inform decision making. It brings demands from the roots, which is the people, to the branches, which is the government. And it creates an inclusive, comfortable space because not everyone feels safe enough to come to a government building to give their input on policy decisions. On a very basic level, often and usually, um, translation and childcare is not provided in places of governance. Um, and just to expand on this, um, it's not only Spanish translation we need. And on the Central Coast, especially in places like Oxnard and Santa Maria, there's a very large Mixteco, Zapoteco, and Triqui population. So we also need um, this translation to happen into um, uh, indigenous, indigenous languages. And we do have people that can do this as long as we 
put resources into it. Um, so house meetings provide a familiar setting as well as a personal connection for participants to feel comfortable enough to share their ideas. These are all crucial in achieving um, intelligence through diversity. And that's something that I really want to stress because as an environmental movement, uh, we really need to create safe spaces. Um, and often, um, I know uh, I experience this uh, feeling of anxiety a lot of times when I know I'm going to go into a room and it's going to be all white people and I'm going to have to validate my whole existence and experience. Um, so with the with house meetings, it's a place where people can feel comfortable and feel like they can come with their whole selves and not have to explain um, who they are. Next one. So basic roles in, a, in organizing a house meeting is one, outreach. Um, and it's not a big effort. All you need is like five to 10 people, which could be friends, families, and coworkers. So this is like bite-sized organizing. Uh, for facilitation, you choose an accessible date, time, and location with that small group. Um, until COVID-19 is over, we should host online conversations using free tools like Google Hangouts or Zoom. Uh, we share background information. We never assume that everyone automatically knows terms like the Green New Deal. So we don't abbreviate anything. We listen and we learn. We take notes. Um, there's actually a pre and post house meeting survey that great folks from UCSB um, Environmental Studies Collab uh, developed, um, which is really great to have their involvement so that we can capture the data that comes from uh, these house meetings. And after you've hosted a house meeting, you reach out to uh, your friends, families, neighbors, and coworkers to see if they are also interested in hosting a house meeting of their own. So it's really, house meetings are a cool strategy because everyone and then also you're cutting it out quite a bit right now so you are uh, pretty the people that um get involved um Good questions to ask during a house meeting, which is that next slide after that. Is who has heard about the Green New Deal and also the Red Deal? How does everyone feel about these ideas within the Green New Deal or the Red Deal? Are, is there anything that has not been thought of already that should be included in developing our people's Red Deal and Green New Deal for the Central Coast? Um, so some things that have come from the initial house meetings that we had, which were actually done in person, is that uh, people definitely feel the need to uh, build clean energy projects. But within that, it's important to build uh, coalitions with the labor community and make sure that clean energy projects include a project labor agreement to make sure that good quality jobs are created out of these. Um, and also including um, all five two match bands and not just um, the federally recognized one. Next one. So um, this is an introduction to um, having house meetings. We also have a toolkit um, that is almost finalized. So if you would like a toolkit on how to host these Green New Deal um, house meetings, which include the Black Lives Matter demands, um, please demonstrate, we can go ahead and send those out on Friday. Um, and uh, just really emphasizing how important it is for us to be there for each other uh, around supporting, um, you know, mutual aid for efforts around food distributions, around uh, getting folks ac access to uh, personal protective equipment, which is something that has been lacking um, in many areas. And we are, um, our volunteer committee, which is made up of Danielle Mason, Shana uh, Crystal, uh, uh, Maggie Drellickman and Elena Salinas and Kademia Salasat, who's our North County organizer. Um, we definitely have um, efforts ongoing with all of these um, projects. So let us know if you want to get plugged in. Um, we have a partnership with La Casa de la Raza around uh, food distribution. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of work that you can get plugged into, whether it's mutual aid or hosting Green New Deal house meetings um, and stopping the Terracor um, 
uh, oil wells that they want to drill in Cat Canyon. So um, there's so much to get involved in and there's so many entry points. So don't feel like your talents are wasted because everyone has talents that they can contribute to the movement. And hopefully we can do this all at the same time as we create safe spaces for people. Thank you, Ana Rosa and Emily. That was a, a lot of information in a short period of time and very heartening to see um, how much work's being done, how much thought's being done, and the impetus behind the house meetings. So thank you. Um, I want to take a minute here um, and unpack those three uh, talks that you've been hearing from before we take a little stretch break and, and and move into breakout sessions. Um, so yeah, actually, big applause for the speakers. Go ahead, let's just unmute for a second. Nice. Yay, thank you, that was amazing. Thank you. Yay. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Thank you very thank you. much. Thank you. Thank you. So I was trying to track the questions as we went along. There are a handful that I think we can get to. In some cases, we will put the, the comments, um, the answers in the comment section. There were some questions. I think Michael Chiakos from my team has joined us. He's the energy program director. And there's some questions that I want to pose to Michael. Um, Michael, I was speaking about um, pairing batteries with rooftop solars. The question is about reasonably priced batteries. Do you have a short answer for that? <laughs> yes, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so right now, energy storage for residential and, and for your solar array is still a little bit expensive, um, but you can, there's definitely a lot of energy storage devices that have been being put in. You can also um, receive some uh, different rebates through the self-generation incentive program through the state. Um, and when you do that, they will also use your battery not only to provide backup power for you, but also to help provide grid services to help us so that we don't need to build as many new natural gas plants and that your residential battery storage can be used um, uh, to help the grid. Um, so I think if you are interested, definitely contact um, your solar installer or some of the solar installers are often doing the battery storage. You can also, um, we'll be, um, releasing our Solarized Santa Barbara program next month. So you can definitely um, keep your ear out for that program and we'll, we will be including a battery storage option. So that would be another great um, possibility. There's also um, a company called Swell Energy that is doing some type of battery leasing. So that might really reduce the price and just reduce it to a monthly price. Um, and uh, you could contact them if you want more information on, on that product. Um, but definitely pay attention to the Solarized Santa Barbara program that we'll be launching, and there'll be a lot more information, some, some webinars with our renewable energy specialists, so we can get you more information on this question. Thank you. Uh, Janet. May I ask a question? Sure. Um, when you say expensive, what would the range be? I live in Lompoc and have had panels for a long, long time, but. Yeah, I haven't priced them myself. And so I, I don't have that data, but I would say maybe anywhere in the 7,000 to 10, $20,000 range. Right, okay. So what's the organization, Swell? Swell or whoever did your solar, um, your, your solar installation, any of the solar companies would be really good ones to um, get information, you know, in more specific pricing. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. I've got some other questions for you as well, but I'll come back in a moment. This question is for Ana Rosa, if you're still with us, Ana Rosa. Uh, the question's about how do the conversations or ideas that are being generated in the house meetings filter back to a central location or, or where do those ideas go? So it's through those surveys that I was talking about. Um, um, and so they, they're going to be putting together the data and then tallying it up so we can see where the interest uh, lies uh, among the people who participate in the house meeting. So it's a partnership with UCSB Environmental Studies Department. Will, will those ideas be published somewhere? 
Uh, yes, the plan is to do that. We're going to um, try to finish this house meeting campaign by the end of the summer and hope, hoping to tally up the data soon after the, that, as soon as the students are able. Um, Emily, I don't know if you want to say more about the student effort. Since you yeah, I mean, so that. this, I feel like undergrads are like some of our most underused, I hate to use the word resource, but they're like incredible, brilliant people who are doing awesome work. Um, yeah, so exactly. We have, um, they put together the survey process. So the idea is that everyone and anyone can be holding a house meeting. If you live in Santa Barbara, you live in Ventura County, you can hold it. You'll have a toolkit, you can do it. There's no real training involved. And the survey is something that you can just fill out right after you do it. So like, what are the main ideas that popped up? You know, what were some of the, you know, questions and concerns? What do people really care about? What do they want to see out of a regional Green New Deal? Um, and then the idea is that the students are going to be engaged in compiling and analyzing them. Um, there's also demographic information, so figuring out, you know, age, age range of folks, you know, um, or maybe occupation, um, also information on like income and that kind of thing if people want to provide that. So long story short, they'll go through that process. We have a lot of different organizations involved and then we will share and publish those sort of like main pillars that come out of it and use that to figure out policies that we want to lobby for. So it's very much a, like generating ideas from the grassroots all the way to lobbying at the policy levels uh, process. Okay, thank you. Um, just one or two more questions. Um, I'm, Linda Phillips, you asked a question or you made a comment about uh, the sea level rise map looking a lot like the light blue line from many years ago. And um, we posted in the chat section a, a link to an article written by CEC's uh, Director of Climate Resilience, Sharon Maine, about just that, about how um, uh, her reflection and having lived through, through all of that debate about the light blue line and now here we are. I have one more question for you, Michael, and then I, I might take one or so, maybe one more question from the group. But the question is, where will the Strauss wind um, project's power go and how will it be used? Well, um... There's two answers to that one. <laughs> the technical answer is that the power will all go to where the closest load source is. So technically, the serving Lompoc and then Santa Maria or other areas, um, if if there's a lar large amount of generation, um, electricity is like a big bathtub though, and people put uh, water in or you know electricity in on one side and then have contracts to take it out on the other side. So. Um, the actual owner of the Lompoc wind farm, I believe um, they've contracted with one of the community choice organizations up north. I, I think it was Monterey Clean Energy, um, but they have a contract to actually purchase the energy um, and that will provide their customers with uh, that, you know, renewable electricity. Okay, thank you. You guys, I'm going to move us uh, shortly into some breakout sessions. But before we do, I just I wanted to provide one reflection on all that we heard um, from the keynotes today. And that is, um, it's actually a quote from a recent Atlantic um, article in the Atlantic, which spotlights the racial pandemic within the viral pandemic and says, of all the threats we know, COVID-19, the COVID-19 pandemic is most like a very rapid version of climate change global in scope, erratic in unfolding, and unequal in its dis distribution. And like climate change, there's no easy fix. Our choices are to remake society or let it be remade. That quote really stuck with me. Um, and, and I wanna kind of hang with that as we go take maybe 15 minutes or so just to, um, just to unpack all that we've heard. You know, these meetings, these, these webinars, it's a, it's a can be quite a lot of information being thrown at folks. We deliberately designed this as a meeting, not just a webinar, so that we could do some personal interaction with folks. So what we're gonna do is just for 15 minutes, go into small um, breakouts with about four or five, maybe six people per room. And those 15 minutes are gonna go by very quickly. Um, but you'll be alerted about a minute or four more before we come back into the main room. So I've got a couple thoughts for you to hang with then um, you could hang with you know what connections you see between social justice and climate justice um, and you could hang with what parallels you see between the the collective social actions we've had to take during the pandemic and what needs to be done to address climate change or 
you can unpack whatever whatever is emerging for you from all that we've talked about. So Iris, I'm going to ask you to, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with this tool, you'll, you'll get a prompt here in a minute to go into a breakout room and then you'll be prompted to come back. Welcoming folks back. So Iris, are we completely back? Yes, we are. Iris or Lisa. Okay. All right. Um, let's like, love to hear if there were any reflections that came out of that. You know, I think our, our group is small enough now. Um, Iris, perhaps, there we are. I'm going to go to gallery view. So I can see not all of you. You might have to use a hand raise tool or you can actually just raise your hand. If there's anything that anyone wanted to share, any reflections that came out of that experience well we had someone who was from naples florida in our group and the the issues that face her are very different it's more like elizabeth ross and rising and issues about the marshes so we got the sense of you know climate change affects people very differently in different parts of the country um, we also got to talk to ivor john and hear a lot more about cec that was very informative Thanks. I'll talk to you later, Sandy, about that because I'd really like to hear what the people from the person from Naples said. I have a good friend who lives there. We talked a little bit in my group um, uh, about the heat and the effect of heat. Um, one of my group members lived in the area um, when she was younger, moved away for 40 years, came back, and really has noticed the difference. Another member of my group lives in Santa Maria, talks about. Um, you know, how the heat is limiting activity and um, requiring her family to keep windows open at night in, in ways that don't always feel safe. So there are some kind of downstream effects from that. Yeah. Anybody else have anything that they want to share? You can use the hand raise tool, which you can find uh, in your, if you go to the top of your box, there's a little thing or you can just raise your hand and I'll, I might be able to see you. I can see some of you. Uh, Susan, go ahead. Susan Horn, unmute. You'll have to unmute, Susan. I'd like to volunteer Barbara Wishgard to just talk about what she just was talking about at the end of the break. It was really fascinating about smoke and asthma and marginalized people being stuck at, in without transportation to move around and stuff. So Barbara, would you say something? Yes, I had my hand raised, so thank you. Um, so I was saying that during the Thomas fire, um, that it was really hard for me to breathe because I have a history of asthma, but I had the privilege of going to my son's house in Camarillo um, and that there wasn't really a lot of good information um, and outreach in Spanish. Um, or services for marginalized communities that I saw, which I, um, so that finally when it seemed like the fire might be encroaching on the east side, they were offering rides and they were offering a place where people could stay. But up until that point, when it was just smoke inhalation, um, there what weren't any, nobody was like cradling that community. And um, I felt like during COVID that that was getting a lot better. And that I think that that's something that we need to uh, move forward, uh, always remembering that uh, making sure that everybody is taken care of as much as they possibly can in the ways that they need. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, Gail, it sounds like you had your hand up. Oh, I just had to unmute. Um, we had a couple of ideas that I, I, and and suggestions and information that I did not know about before. Um, I think it was Barbara Lindemann uh, talked to us about donut economics and she might want to jump in and explain that um, as a 
uh, an economic idea of, of looking at our system as a whole and how um, we need to work it within the donut. I'm going to try this for her, see if I got it. <laughs> so we need to work within, within the outer limits of our planetary limits, limits to growth, limits to our survivability. And with the inner part of the donut being uh, people's needs and their, you know, sir, their their ability to be um, resilient and community and to have food and shelter and and uh, have their needs and their wants met. Um, that was a, an idea, I guess, from a book by Kate uh, Rayworth. I don't know how to spell it that um, hopefully she'll share with us. And um, we also learned about something that Faye Cox is working on, uh, a whole bunch of small books on big topics. Um, and hopefully we'll all be able to use those and uh, benefit from them and share them. That's it. Maybe if any of them wanna say more, please do. <laughs> Okay, no, that was good. And I'm trying to figure out how to uh, pull up my chat screen again. I don't seem to be able to get it. So I will. It's Kate Rayworth, R-A-W-O-R-T-H. Yeah, called it's Donut Economics. And it's a very useful uh, scheme for um, analyzing how we need to make economic decisions uh, immediately that are beyond the idea of unlimited growth. Growth in what way and for what needs to be the answers that we, the questions that we ask. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Gail, for surfacing that. Mary, Bird. Hi. Um, I, I just found this very helpful and very interesting. Um, I just wanted to give Emily and Anna Rosa a shout out for, for bringing up some of these issues and how to incorporate them and what we're thinking about. I was mentioning how we used to, you know, show a, a, a graph at the air pollution control district about, okay, industrialization comes along, boom. We've got all these greenhouse gas emissions. We have all this stuff. We have great concerns here, but not the extra connection of colonialization. And I appreciate that. And I think that's something we need to really educate people about really, really talk about and really say, you know, it's not really fair to hold China accountable and India accountable for daily greenhouse gas emissions when we are the legacy creator of these things and our companies have been. So I found that super useful and I really appreciate everything. Here, here. Good job. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna do one more quick scan. Again, I can't see you all in one swoop. So if you have a question, just raise your hand and keep it up because I'm having to scan through. If you have a question or a comment. Sigurd, I have a couple of questions here that have come in um, for different people. Um, so I'll just share if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. um, the first one is for Michael Chiakos. Um, it's actually already, I think, off the call. Okay, so, um, and we will, so what we can do um, is ask him that about, uh, someone had asked what did the Board of Supervisors do about the utility scale solar in our county? Um, so we can ask him to maybe. Yeah, I think this was just came up yesterday and I haven't had a report on it, so. Great, okay. All right, um, and then um, another, another question um, was for um, Gail uh, Osharenko from Janet Blevins. How can I arrange to show your creation broken to my club here in Lompoc? So if Gail, if you want to unmute so you can answer. <laughs> Somehow, I, oh, there we go. I had lost the screen. Um, uh, my film about the 2015 oil spill broke is actually available on Amazon Prime. And the best way to find it is to put in broke, uh, Santa Barbara oil spill. If that doesn't get you there, add my last name, Osharenko. 
which you can see on the screen. Um, and you should, it, should, it should get you there and you should be able to see the film that way. That's at the moment the only way I know other than, yeah, that's it. Thank you. I contributed to the project and I haven't seen it yet, so I, I will definitely do that. Thank you. Excellent. It is a great film. I got to see it uh, in one of its previews. So thank you, Gail, for all of your work on that. Great storytelling. Community for helping me make it and, and being participants. It's really about community and uh, what happened, what we don't want to happen again. I, I have a DVD, I would, so if, if anybody can't get it another way and wants to borrow it and show it, I'm sure Gail wouldn't mind if you borrowed mine. I wouldn't. I, I think Thank you, Linda. Maybe the library has a copy, too. Okay. Uh, I'll try Good. to make sure that they have it some way. Beautiful. Okay, last scan, and then I'm going to bring it to a close. So if you have something you want to say, put your hand up and keep it up while I look through all the screens here, please. Wayne. Thank you. Um, yeah, the colonization uh, issue uh, was, was really interesting. Uh, I also want, just wanted to bring to your attention that I saw a, a movie called The Story of Plastic uh, recently, and that, uh, showed that the fossil fuel industry is positioning itself to really make profit in plastics as the transportation sector starts winding down. So uh, I think we really need to be alert to that, uh, yeah. you know, the plastic issue. It not, not only takes a lot of energy and fossil fuels to do that, but what do you do with the waste? Like only 5% really gets recycled. So that's mm -hmm. another issue that uh, is environmentally concerning with the uh, climate change also. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. I had dinner with uh, the um, creator of that, Annie Leonard, who's the director of National uh, Greenpeace. And I asked her, it was maybe, I don't know, a little over a year ago, and I asked her what was most on her mind, what was most concerning, and she spoke just to that point, which is as the fossil fuel industry, you see the writing on the wall in terms of um, uh, shutting down um, projects, refinery projects and so forth, and drilling projects, that they are looking, they are deliberately looking for ways um, to build new market for more stuff made out of plastic. So if was found, found that to be a little bit disheartening, not necessarily where I want to end <laughs> here because it's definitely, we've, we've had um, decades now of fighting the fossil fuel in industry and just feel like we got um, making some progress and that this is their pivot. So but thank you for sharing that. Yeah, maybe if I can add one last heartening note um, <laughs> along those lines is I think something that everyone should keep an eye on is watch how these climate lawsuits play out. So it's disheartening seeing what the industry is doing, but just as the tobacco industry eventually was sued by states for the public health crisis that tobacco causes, um, there's a lot of cities, counties, and states that are suing current fossil fuel companies for the climate damages they're experiencing. And with the idea that the, um, the companies can pay for adaptation measures. And so there's ways that we can hold these folks accountable and ensure that we're supporting community. Thank you, excellent. And then as Irene says, you know, vote, 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 volunteer to vote, volunteer for voter registration projects. Great. Yes, vote, yes. I wanna thank our speakers. I wanna thank League of Women Voters for hosting this. This was really, um, you know, a really generative conversation. I learned a lot. Um, I felt really kind of inspired by the passion and wisdom and the, um, yeah, the generational, very, you know, wide range of um, perspectives and, and people who are showing up here. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy, Vijaya, Mary. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Sigrid. It has been wonderful. Thank you to all of the panelists, Emily, wonderful. Uh, Irene, we learned so much. There's so much information. Actually, I think I had to go through the chat box again because there's a lot yeah. of links and. Uh, so, a lot of things that, that I didn't know, like the Red Deal. Um, 
<laughs> yeah. so I want to speak to that actually. Um, there, uh, we put a lot of uh, links and resources in the chat field. We're going to pull those back out. We're going to send out a, a follow up email um, to everybody who registered for this, so you'll have those. You'll have those links. You don't have to try to scribble them down. That is, that's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much Thanks. to CEC uh, for hosting Iris. You did a great job. You know, doing all of this. It's it's. It's the technical stuff. Uh, thank you for taking it off the league's plate. <laughs> and uh, we really, really appreciate our partnership. Thank you so much. Those of you who know me know that I really like stories. And so since we just have a couple of minutes left, I'm gonna tell you one, then we can, we can leave it that. I'll actually stick around afterward if anyone wants to just chat for a while. We'll just pretend like we're at the Faulkner Gallery or something. But this is a story that I read years ago um, and that really stuck with me. And many of you will recognize the name of David Brower, who was um, who founded several really prominent environmental organizations and was the first executive director for the Sierra Club in the 50s and 60s. Um, this is a story from his youth in one of his biographies. Um, when he was younger, he, among his many kind of outdoor pursuits, he um, raised swallowtail butter, uh, butterflies from eggs that he had gathered off of wild anise plants in his yard. And those eggs, of course, became caterpillars, and the caterpillars, of course, wove themselves into chrysalids and became butterflies. And during one of those moments, uh, right at that moment of transfer, transformation, when the chrysalids started to open, to split open, he tried to help. He decided to um, carefully widen the split so the butterfly could emerge more easily. Um, but when those butterflies came out, they managed to kind of crawl to a nearby twig, but their, their wings never unfurled and they actually ended up um, dying. What David didn't know from all of that was that butterflies exert um, themselves, when they exert themselves coming out of that chrysalis, it pumps fluid through their abdomen and basically activates their wings. And I have always found that to be a really poignant story on a lot of levels, but today um, it was up for me this morning as I was just thinking about what's really required of us right now as we flex new muscles and stretch ourselves into uncomfortable places and and really um, activate those wings, knowing that no one's coming to save us. We really have to lean on each other and learn from each other and do the work both at the personal level and the community level and bring together youth and elders and listen to all voices and acknowledge the work that it's gonna to take to dismantle um, many of the, the roots of um, racism and other causes of climate change. But I wanna thank you all. I wanna continue just to you know gently Hold yourself, allow yourself some grace during this time, but really lean in and activate your wings. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Secret. Thank you, Katie. Kathy. Yes. Thank you, everybody. Emily. Great Thanks to my team, Nicole, Lisa.